Welcome, Wargamers, to the portent-filled paths of the Mortal Realms, because today we are talking all about the Celestial Warbringers of the Stormcast Eternals. This topic was requested by Jonathan Davis, and if you would like a question answered or a specific sub-faction or something covered, go ahead and leave in the comments down below. I use comments for all kinds of video ideas. Now, the Celestial Warbringers are actually a very difficult one to get good information about, and that's simply because there's not a lot of stories that include them. In fact, uh, I went through all of my Stormcast Eternal Battle Tomes, all the way back to the first one, and, and while their overall feel and vibe has not changed a ton, there's still not a lot of actual stories that include them. And as you have may have noticed with my other sub-factions I've been doing recently, I try to always have like an exemplary battle, but there's just not a lot here. That being said, it's a shame, because this is one of the single most unique and interesting Stormcast chambers that exists. And we're going to talk all about it today. Right before we jump into that though, I just want to give a shout out to not just gaming. If you are looking for any kind of hobby supplies and or games workshop models, please consider using the link in the description down below. They have everything from Army Painter, AK Interactive, Green Stuff World, Gamergrass, a whole bunch of great companies. Every single time you use that link, it goes to supporting me, my wife, our cats, the whole channel, and I could not be more thankful for everyone who has done so already. Now, for those of you who are new to Age of Sigmar, as I see comments on my videos a lot that are saying they're just jumping in, the Stormcast Eternals really are kind of the poster boys of the game. These monstrously tall demigods that have been infused with the power of Azir, or lightning, itself. These are heroes of renown who were struck down mostly during the Age of Chaos, and Sigmar, instead of letting their souls go to the afterlife, plucked them up and reforged them into these mighty heroes. The idea being that they can win an overall war of attrition against Chaos because when a Stormcast dies, their soul arcs back to Azir, the Realm of Heavens, to be reforged again. And so you get these kind of recycling of troops that no other faction truly has. Except for maybe, you know, death factions. Now, as Sigmar has been collecting these souls of great heroes from Yor, uh, he's basically been organizing them by loose patterns. So, for example, like the Hallowed Knights are all the most faithful and religiously devout of the souls that he combed. If you get collected by Sigmar and you're that kind of person, he's going to dump you in the Hallowed Knights, generally speaking. Astral Templars is vaguely made up of anyone who comes from a hunting culture or renowned for their prowess on the battlefield and boasting and that kind of thing. The Knights Excelsior are these uncompromising, they see everything in black and white type personalities. So he, like temperaments are really what separates the various storm hosts. And that trickles down into how they conduct themselves on the battlefield. Well, moving from talking about, you know, Stormcasts in general to talking specifically about these Celestial Warbringers, what is their unique thing? Put simply, Wizards. This is the premier spell casting storm host. And by that I mean every single member of the Celestial Warbringers is in some way a wizard. Whether it's like a very low level thing that barely registers at all. Or they're unleashing like hell storms from their fingertips and just annihilating the foe. Now we're going to talk about the various ways that this is represented in their lore, but just understand that. So they approach everything with this toolbox of spells and, and, and portents and signs and mystic information to every situation they come about more so than any other storm host. It is said in multiple places that they have the single largest sacrosanct chamber amongst any other stormcast. And if you are unfamiliar, this, uh, when Nagash made his power play during the Soul Wars, again, I'm sorry if you're new, there's a lot of information, but basically the undead factions got really, really uppity, and so Sigmar needed to unleash a weapon that's made specifically to fight undead things. Taking all the knowledge that they've gained about the ethereal, the afterlife, the demonic, all of it, and then just dropping it onto the battlefield and turning it into a weapon. So the Sacrosanct Chamber is essentially your Ghostbuster host of the Stormcast. And theirs is the largest. Again, they have the most magic, and the Sacrosanct Chamber oftentimes will channel their personal magic prowess into their weapons. And there are awesome models to represent this. Channeling all of their etheric energy into their hammers, or their shields, or whatever it might be. 
evocators can come in riding all kinds of mounts, hurling lightning at the enemy, and essentially just electrifying anything that touches them. Now, more so than any other storm host, this makes them uniquely dangerous because if you go against an opponent's army, and I don't mean opponent in the game, I mean like a chaos army in the lore or whatever, and they are not prepared to deal with a psychic onslaught is what I'm going to call it. They're going to have a bad time. Granted, there's a lot of ways in the mortal realms that magic can be deflected or shut down or absorbed. But if you're just talking about random orc tribes or, you know, little pockets of chaos that are maybe have one wizard in them, Celestial Warbringer is going to rock their world. Now, one other thing to note here is that recently in a uh, Soulbound, which is the Age of Sigmar role-playing game by Cubicle 7, go check it out. They had an expansion called Misthaven, which is a city that exists in Ulgu, the Realm of Shadows. And it's said here that this is where a major base for the Celestial Warbringers is set up specifically guarding this big realm gate that exists on open water. They have a huge ship fortification with the city of Misthaven built all around it. It's a city that exists completely on the water away from the land masses so it can move, it can break apart into many pieces and come back together later on. But the Warbringers love it here because one, not only do they get to be stormcast, I mean, it's just, it's just cool. In the Lamb of Shadows where everything's kind of like tends to be more sneaky and stealthy, being able to light up an entire battlefield literally with lightning so that your forces can see the enemy and they are blinded and cannot see you is quite useful. Even just practical things like walking around Olgu is difficult because the realm itself is constantly trying to blast you with illusions, mirages, all these kinds of things to mess with your brain. It's all about trickery and sorcery. But then your Celestial Warbringer just like taps his staff and a flashlight goes off and you can see everything really well. The ability to discern illusion from reality is essential in the Realm of Shadows. So I love that. I think that they uniquely fit into their realm. Whereas some other ones like, you know, for example, the Knights Excelsior are based in Gur. There's nothing particularly bestial about them. In fact, that would be the Astral Templars. So, while I like the Knights Excelsior, they are my favorite one, and they exist in the realm of Gur, and that's awesome, I think in terms of taking the strengths of a Swarm Host and applying it to the literal environment that they are in, the Warbringers win, hands down, every single time. Now, of course, we've mentioned several times here that they are powerful wizards. When I mention that each one of them, regardless of what they do, from the lowliest Liberator, which is the cheapest bro that you can get for this army, all the way to the most expensive, powerful Psyker themselves. I say Psyker, that's my holdover from 40k, I apologize. Wizard. And the reason I say that they all have this ability is because one of the things that the key components of a Celestial Warbringer is that they are all seers who see their own death. Which is a very strange thing. So like, even if the unit on the tabletop can't use spells, every single Celestial Warbringer Liberator has enough portent ability to be able to project into the future and know when they are going to die. Now, it's a little bit vague here because it's not stated if it's when they die and go back to Azir to be reforged, or if it's like permadeath, because there are ways for Stormcast to perma-die. But honestly, it doesn't really matter which one it is. Because this is a solely unique thing that belongs to the Celestial Warbringers, and it affects every single other aspect of their personality. Every one of them can glimpse little pathways into the future and make decisions as such. Now, while this may seem like, oh, they'd be really dour and depressed and sad because they know they're going to die, the truth is actually the opposite. It makes them incredibly brave and willing to tap deeper into magics that they probably kind of overload themselves, you know, like when you take all the safety stuff off of a car and you can ramp the engine way hotter than it's supposed to be. That kind of thing. And the reason that they do this fearlessly is because they know I'm not going to die here. So I might as well just go like all in. I'm going to die somewhere else. So I got a two up re-rollable plot armor that's going to keep me from it. And so they become incredibly aggressive. Other wizards might be like, well, you know, I'm going to hold off because I don't want to tap too deeply and lose control and, you know, unleash the purple sun that kills me and everyone around me. No, 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 no. We're not worried about that. And so we'll see the Celestial Warbringers just being very aggressive on the battlefield. Now, when it does come to the day where they die, again, whether it's 
permadeath or to be reforged, they don't back away. I mean, they're they're probably less jovial about it, but they're very stoic and like, well, this is just what's going to happen. There's nothing that can avoid it. Uh, this this is where my plot armor ends, and plot mortal wounds begin. So not only does it make them like not dour, and of course it does make them more aggressive on the battlefield. But one thing that's also pointed out in specifically the third edition battle tome here is that it makes them exceptionally good with humans, which is something I kind of want to talk about before we wrap it up with why is this cool. Using their ability to sense little ticks into the future, not so much like, you know, they can see every pathway of possibilities, but just little bits. It has shaped the way that they work with humans, as has their ability to see their own deaths. So one of the things it mentioned specifically in the third edition book is they will allow some illicit substances and, and people to have their little foibles within a city of Sigmar. Right? I don't care if you get drunk once a week, you know, go have fun with your friends, grab a pint, have a good time. Just don't go too far with things. And this is in stark contrast to say, for example, the Knights Excelsior who are so black and white that it's like I don't want you to do anything that may even possibly sort of kind of lead to tempted by chaos. You know, it's like, it's very harsh. And if you cross a line, you're dead. And the Celestial Warbringers are like, you know, we'll keep the hard drugs out of the city, but yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll legalize the weed. Everyone can chill out. That's cool. It's whatever. They just, they kind of work with people. And, and, and part of that is attributed to their mortality. That is to say, other Stormcasts, you know, they know they'll be reforged. They hope they'll be reforged. They don't really want to permadie in the realm of chaos. But they don't think about their own deaths. They perceive themselves as being immortal. Whereas the Celestial Warbringers are constantly aware of the fact that they are going to die. Now, whether it is to be reforged or not doesn't really matter. Their mortality is in their mind. And so I think what they're really getting at is that mortality brings us to a point where we see value in things in moderation, but we can like get excited about life. And so they are quite nice to mortals. They believe in things like family and festivals and not being too harsh because if you're too harsh, then you have an uprising and all of those secrets and evils get just hidden deeper and deeper. Instead, they're like, hey, listen, you like to drink, I like to drink, let's drink and hang out. And at some point in the night, the Celestial Warbringers, you'll be like, that's enough, you can stop. And you stop and everyone has a good time and it's just crazy to me that like what seems to be like you know all chill no thrill stormcast are also like on the battlefield living lightning storms because they just are covered in plot armor as i mentioned before it's rad i like that they can be both get you a stormcast who can do both allow low grade illicit drugs to come into your town and also be the hero you need him to be on the battlefield fist bump and so let's move into why is this cool, right? I mean, I'm, I, obviously I'm being a bit of a jokester when it comes to how they um, interact with humans. Although the illicit drugs are specifically mentioned in the third edition battle tome in their section. Just to point that out, that's not a Doug original. They straight up allow certain vices to come through the city because it's healthy for people. It lets off steam as long as it's not excessive. But as far as why is this cool, I have a few things here. One of them is I just love psychic themed factions. I like the Thousand Suns in 40k for the exact same reason. Because you have a baseline troop in, in that game. It's, uh, you know, a Space Marine or a Chaos Space Marine. Here it's obviously a Stormcast. But when you say that they're a magical themed faction or psychic or whatever you want to call it, they approach every situation with a totally different toolbox. And I really enjoy that. Our toolbox, quote unquote, here is absolute annihilation on the battlefield because they are absolutely sure that they are not going to die this day. Grim determination, knowing that their death is inevitable, but also the ability to unleash all kinds of psychic powers which your opponent may or may not have defenses for. It makes you highly threatening. And the cool thing about the Warbringers, I just have to emphasize, every single storm host has every single chamber. So like, you don't have to only play ex uh, Sacrosanct units. In fact, if you took all Liberators and then like one wizard hero, sure, that's thematic as well if they needed to. It's whatever gets the job done, because remember, they see the future. They know what tools they need to bring. So I just love all of the different permeations of armies you can make because they would always come with the right tool set for the right job. 
And that makes it fun from a collecting point of view. I mean, it just justifies everything that they need. The next thing to point out is that they are not the standard Stormcast story that we get. I mean, obviously in the era of the Beast, the current arc, right? Season three, if you want to call it that for our, our ongoing narrative of Age of Sigmar, has a lot of stories about the Stormcast becoming very scary. As they reforge, they kind of lose some of their ability to empathize with mortals. They kind of become more distant, more sullen. And with our story taking place in Gur, a lot of the stories we've seen have concerned the Knights Excelsior, who, like I said before, very black and white, very aggressive, and unforgiving. In the book Dominion by Darius Hanks, which is a wonderful place to start with Age of Sigmar lore, we get the sense that people, like the subjects of the city, are scared of their defenders. Your average person is terrified to stand in the presence of a Stormcast Eternal, no matter what rank or whatever they are. However, Misthaven seems like a pretty rockin' town, because their storm host, of course, the Celestial Warbringers, seem pretty chill as long as no one gets too far into anything. And that makes them highly unique. Now, not every citizen is scared of every single Stormcast, but it seems to be a lot of the more recent stories from the second half of 2nd edition and most of 3rd have been of the average person from the cities of Sigmar being a bit uneased around Stormcast. And so this is a really cool alternate to that of like, hey, these guys are have a party and have a good time. I like them. They genuinely want to defend us and they understand what it means to enjoy the moment because it will pass. Again, they're not mortals, but they still have the concepts of mortality in their minds. And that's really going to bring me to my last point. I kind of want to save this for last because it's kind of heavy, but it's really is the question is, is mortality essential to connecting with our humanity. The Stormcast Eternals were all humans, as far as we know, that were taken up to Azir, stripped of their mortality, but not their humanity, necessarily. They still have personalities and memories and such for the most part, but as they keep reforging, their humanity erodes. Whereas it seems, for the Celestial Warbringers, it seems to remain intact, and I wonder if it is that link to their mortality. There is an end, and that makes the moment all the sweeter. It's why I can allow small vices that are totally harmless and still enjoyable. They might be a waste of time and money, but so is everything. Look at Warhammer. But you can still enjoy it and add meaning to your life and, and, and love the moment that you're in. Even though when you hit the battlefield, there's a job to do. This is what we're here for. And to that end, I, I, I can't think of a better storm host to live under. For real, I'm, I'm planting the flag. If I was going to move to the Immortal Realms, I'm going to Misthaven. I'm going to get myself a little houseboat, park it right up there, and just love it. I'll probably get robbed every single day by Scourge Privateers, but, you know, that's just the way life is. It's no different than living in New Jersey. And so that, Jonathan Davis, is the best that I could do regarding the Celestial Warbringers. I hope that answers some questions for you. I was really surprised and bummed that there were not more stories concerning them, but if you have some that you would like to point out, or they're in a Black Library novel that I haven't read yet because they have pumped out so many short stories that I can't keep up, leave it in the comments down below. I would love to read it. And keep posting or commenting what sub-factions or things you would like explored next. Thank you so much, and happy wargaming.